Yeah, so thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, if you asked economists until recently what to do in a crisis situation like the current one, one of the most common pieces of advice was that if you actually went, if you had to cut back, if you had to balance budgets, one of the best things you could do was to reduce expenditure on a vast scale. So, for example, people like Alberto Alessina told us that we could actually cut our way back to growth. By reducing expenditure, we would actually lower the wage bill, we'd increase profitability in the private sector, and growth would sooner or later follow. And best of all, in related work, they argued that there was no political penalty for this, that governments that actually pursued this policy of hard knocks would actually be rewarded at the ballot box and that their chances of being re-elected would not go down, might actually be the same or even be going up. Um, it'd be nice if we could have the presentation on here. Um, now, what I'm going to try to, so there's some question marks about the economic side of this argument. Um, what I want to do today is talk about the non-economic issues with this particular argument, okay? So the image I wanted you to see, which will be vividly in front of your eyes, not least because one of those is just outside, the thing that's, in, according to my view and in related work with Jacopo Ponticelli, who is actually here, a graduate student at Pompeo Fabra, the thing that's really wrong with this argument, at least some of the time, but when it matters the most, is the possibility of social and political unrest, of the social fabric starting to fray and society starting to fall apart. So the thing I want you to think about now is actually the images of burning barricades in downtown Barcelona or Syntagma Square in Athens. And what we did was to look at the last 100 years of budget cuts in both Europe and in Latin America and to try and see how much of the unrest that we see over time and across space can be explained by budget cuts. That's the thing that we try to do. So the, ba the basic punchline of the paper that uh, we wrote a while ago is to say that the link is very strong, it's very clear, and it's somewhat nonlinear. So you can cut a little bit, and the probability of unrest, as we define it, goes up. But once you hit budget cuts on the scale of 2 or 3% relative to GDP, the probability of major unrest events increases exponentially. So how do we actually go about analyzing this? How do we actually try to make this empirically tractable? Um, we use a database that's not our own, uh, compiled by um, uh, Arthur Banks and co-authors. And they look at unrest events of the following type, riots, anti-government demonstrations, general strikes, attempted revolutionary overthrows, and political assassinations. So we use a very sophisticated way of aggregating all of these by adding them up and call this variable chaos and see how it varies over time. And you won't be surprised if I tell you that, for example, Europe in the interwar period has very high levels of this type of instability that's dwindled in recent years. If you look at Latin America, that's much more stable, so you actually have quite high levels of unrest, but then in any one country, you can go from basically no unrest events to very high levels. And we throw this variable against our time series of budget cuts and see how much of a correlation we actually get. So before I actually tell you exactly what this yields, here's how we think about this. We don't think that there's an automatic deterministic relationship between unrest on the one hand and budget cuts on the other. The metaphor I like to use is to think a little bit about what it takes to get a forest fire going. Most of the time, you can throw away your burning cigarette in the middle of the forest and nothing happens. But sometimes, everything will go up in flames. The difference is that sometimes the forest has been so arid, there's been so little rain, that there's a lot of combustible material around. Now, what's the analogy? This burning cigarette, I think, is, for example, some unfortunate motorist in LA being beat up, some poor immigrant being shot by police. Accidents happen. They happen all the time, and most of the time, nothing happens. But sometimes, like in LA in 1992, or in London last summer, there's so much combustible material in a society that the possibility of everything going up in flames is very high. And we think of austerity as one of these factors that actually makes the forest particularly dry, that adds to the stock of combustible material that can actually go up in flames if one of these triggers happens on top. 
So we do this analysis for Europe, for 26 countries from 1919 to 2009. We do the analysis for South America from 1937 to 1995. And every time you cut expenditure on a large scale, you get more of these unrest events. And then we say, there's sometimes a little bit of unrest. You have a riot here. You have a demonstration there. That's pretty much business as normal. But sometimes you get these big spikes. You actually have 5, 6, 10, 20 unrest events in a single year. And what we fi find, what we show, is that for these years of very heavy unrest, the link with austerity is particularly strong. So you can say, well, that doesn't have to be a big surprise, right? Countries that austerity and budget cuts do not fall from the sky. It's not as if you wake up one morning as finance minister and God whispers in your ears, you know, let's cut the uh, expenditure by a couple of percent. This is probably associated with hard times. If you actually have a lot of economic issues going wrong, you will be more likely to have to retrench fiscally. And at the same time, there will be lots of issues that people are actually unhappy about. So this correlation may not actually be causal. It may be accidental. One of the things we do to think about this is to actually control for the changes in GDP level. So if you actually try to control for growth and you take out that component of unrest that's just driven by times being hard, you don't change the basic result at all. Austerity on top still has this additional effect. The second thing we do is there's a subset in our data series where for every single unrest event we know based on a detailed analysis of newspaper reports about it, we know what it is that people protest against. You can only do this for some countries and for some of these years, and that's where we find the strongest link. So that makes us much more confident that for this 100 year span, we're actually identifying the right link. Now, let's think about the policy implications of this. We do this for austerity measures in terms of budget cuts, expenditure cuts, and you can try to distinguish between different types, um, but there's only so much you can do uh, given the available data, so you cannot go as far back in time as we would like. If you do the same thing for revenue measures, if you actually look at the balancing of the budget that comes from raising revenue, you get a very weak effect. It could be there, it could not be there, but even if it is there, it's tiny in comparison in terms of orders of magnitude compared to the effects of cutting expenditure. So the first implication that comes very strongly out of our work is that if you actually have to balance the budget, if you're trying to impose austerity, what you should do if you're concerned about the potential for your society starting to fall apart and a wave of unrest and demonstrations um, tearing uh, at the fabric of your social compact, the thing you should do is actually think more about raising revenue rather than cutting expenditure. And this is the exact opposite of what the political economy literature led by Alberto Alessina and so forth was telling us, who always said that in economic terms, the best thing you can do if you have to balance the budget to actually cut expenditure and not even think about the revenue side overall. Okay? So that's the political implication um, the, in terms of thinking about what to do to, to balance the budget. Now, one of the things we're currently interested in doing more about is to look at two things. One is, once you get these big unrest events, what's the reaction of fiscal policy? So if you actually go right to the edge where countries start to fall apart, what is the typical country doing in terms of its expenditure patterns afterwards? And what we find is that governments actually tap on the brakes. They're actually not going for austerity anywhere near as hard as they did before. So you actually reverse many of these expenditure cuts. The typical country that experiences these periods of political and social unrest will actually reverse many of these budget cuts and hence will actually not see any of the benefits. So this is really a lose-lose proposition if you go to the point where you actually have a high likelihood of uh, political and social instability because you actually have to undo so many of these expenditure cuts basically the next year. And that's because, and then you understand better why it is that countries with higher levels of instability on average have higher levels of public debt too. They just find it incredibly hard to cut um, in bad times. So 
That's one of the things that's interesting about this. The other thing that I think is interesting is if you actually look at the level of uncertainty in economies, and you can proxy it by the level of volatility in the country's stock market and so forth, you see that this shoots up every time you have these unrest events. So even if everything else stays the same, you add one riot, one demonstration, uh, one general strike, one assassination, you can see uncertainty spike in the country. And we understand a lot better as a result of research in recent years, which is not what we've done, but for example, what Nick Bloom has done in Stanford, that uncertainty, an uncertainty shock, actually has incredibly strong contractionary effects. So within six months, with a big shock and uncertainty, you actually see a collapse in industrial production by about a percent or so, and it lasts for over a year. So if you compare this to the impact of the, raising the federal funds rate, for example, this is a very quick reaction, it's a very strong reaction. So what this creates then is actually the potential for an austerity trap, and an austerity trap that has a slightly different flavor from the one that Eric talked about. What you can get is if you cut too much and you get these unrest events and you start to see the politics of the street taking over, then you get these uncertainty shocks which actually depress economic activity even more than austerity on its own would have done. As a result, you're going to have lower levels of economic activity, tax takes going to be lower, your budget deficit's going to be even higher. So even without having to worry about a sort of de long summers, sometimes austerity is bad kind of economic context, simply because of the political and social reaction and the importance of uncertainty effects, you will actually end up in this downward economic spiral where then you can either carry on cutting more because now your budget position is worse again, or you have to exit this spiral. Now, as I have the privilege of being the last speaker in the session, and I'm fully aware that I'm the man standing between you and coffee, um, let me just talk about policy implications. So I think one simple policy implication that's not terribly helpful at this time is if we actually take seriously this potential for the additional constraint of social and political instability operating at times of crisis, then even in good times, we have to be much more careful in terms of our budget positions that we can run. I think that's the easiest thing to say. And then, you know, um, if we can only rerun the 2000s, it'd be nice if we'd been more careful in accumulating debts and so forth, simply because it's so much harder to rectify any kind of budget imbalance in hard times. Thinking about the European crisis at the moment, I think I'd like to differ a little bit from what Eric said here. I think the Mediterranean countries will find it very, very hard to follow the path led by the Baltic countries. Why? Simply because of these images you have outside here of Athens burning, um, of the indignados in Spain and so forth. Long before you can see any benefit in terms of the competitiveness of a country like Spain, the country will fall apart. At the moment, all of this is very mild. There's a couple of anarchists having a bit of fun burning a couple of garbage bins. But in a country with 40% youth unemployment, unit labor costs are still rising at the same rate today as they are in Germany. And that's with zero growth and huge budget cuts. I do not think that any Mediterranean country can implement enough austerity to get unit costs down so far as is necessary to restore competitiveness and reduce the current account deficits without the whole country going up in flames. I think the potential for things going wrong on a very large scale, not a couple of policemen hurt, but major damage to large parts of inner cities and so forth, the potential for this is at least 10% already and will go higher if we continue uh, implementing austerity on the current scale. So let me end on this somewhat pessimistic note. Um, I'll leave it there.